hey, you want to be successful. You, your players are counting on you to do a good job. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of the pressure we put on ourselves as coaches. And that's the reality of it. special conversation for me today. I have my, my, my first boss, um, who's turned into pretty much a lifelong friend and mentor and, uh, um, somebody I still admire joining me today. I have Ryan Thompson. He's been the head coach of mid American Nazarene for, for quite some time now, but Ryan, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Rob, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk to you and man, working with you. I don't feel like boss, uh, employee relationship was really what we had. We had, a great uh, friendship and work together to build build this program and get it started off on the right foot. So uh, I, I really appreciate your friendship as well. You gave me the best job offer I've ever gotten. I don't know if you remember, you said, Rob, I can pay you anywhere from zero to $3,000 and I won't know for three months. <laughs> and I was so desperate to be in coach. <laughs> you gonna let me recruit too? <laughs> yeah, still, still using that line today, you know? No, <laughs> but no, that's great. I'm thankful for you. I'm glad you were here. I, I still think back about when I first took this job and I had you and, and Matt Allison, and that was, I was blessed to have two great assistants trying to figure out how to coach. So it was a huge help to me. Some bad baseball along the way, but it was <laughs> fun. So briefly kind of tell everybody listening about your coaching journey. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, leading the 21st century athlete. And I think we'll get into some advice for young coaches today. Why, from your experiences, why should people care what you have to say? Yeah, I think my coaching journey began with a, a real passion for sports first. Um, I love playing, loved all sports, loved the strategy. Um, I think that's where it began. And then when my playing career was over, um, really had some some influential coaches along the way that made a huge impact in me. And uh, so then when it was over, I was done playing, um, had an opportunity to get into coaching and and I've been fortunate to do it almost 20 years now. And as I thought about this, um, you know, why should you listen? I've been doing it a long time. I've made a lot of mistakes and I've learned from them. So I think anytime you've done something for, for a while, um, you have the opportunity to, um, to learn by doing, and that can be a refining process and help you learn some things and see some things and, and look back and go, man, I would love to do that differently. But, but uh, you learn from it as you go. Is there anything when you think about ways you screwed up, is there any story or particular thing that comes to mind? Oh man, I, I just think I, I always kind of cringe when you think back to who you were as a, as a coach early on. I, I just, I think maybe the first five to eight years, I can just see so much of just trying to be somebody I was not. And so I think you look back and go, oh man, that's, that's hard to look at, but you learn from it and you realize the longer you do it, you get more comfortable with your personality and who you are as a coach and, and uh, are able to find kind of the sweet spot of how you're gifted, your personality. And I think um, you become a lot more genuine when you get to that place. Yeah. I think back to our years to, I was trying to find that voice. I was trying to be Mike gear who uh, coached me all growing up, most extroverted, energetic guy ever. And I'm an introvert by nature and I go home so tired. Mm -hmm. And then you were kind of, Trying to be Sam Riggleman and how did yeah. your personality fit into that? And I, I bet you experienced some of the same things, just the exhaustion of trying to figure it out. Yeah, just trying to trying to focus on things that aren't necessarily important to you or you feel like you're trying to make it a, a yeah, just, just trying to be somebody I'm not. And yeah, Sam was a Hall of Famer, unbelievable coach, but I've had to learn to do it my way and um, how I can do it based on my personality. And I think Man, yeah, wearing yourself out in those early years and then just caring too much about what people think and and coaching for other people and what people are thinking about you instead of just knowing why you do what you do and and uh, just stay in there and being being content and confident in that. So why do you that's a big way into the next question. Why do you do what you do? What's a what's what's your purpose? Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple things. I think one, I mean, just practically, I think it, I, I strongly believe it's what God has gifted me to do. When I see the coaches who have shaped me and, um, and then the opportunities I've been given, I believe I'm where I'm supposed to be. And 
I see, for example, I mean, um, why do I coach? Why do I do it? Um, I think it starts with when I was at Bethel College under Sam Riggleman, who was a Christian coach and I wasn't a Christian. And just through that process of coming to faith, um, I can see how the Lord used that and saved me. And then he's put me on mission to do the same thing and to coach young men and use that as a way to help them grow spiritually and, and uh, you know, in all areas of their life. And, and so um, I coach to, um, to glorify God and to, to do what I've been called to do. So I think what you just said, totally agree. I think it can be pretty hard to understand at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what does, when you say explore, allowing your players to explore faith, grow in their faith, give us some tangible, what does that, what does that look like in your day to day? Yeah, I think one, I think to see, how a Christian coach responds to different situations. Um, so I think one of the first and most important things I can do is, is recognize that I have to lead um, by example, and I have to be someone who they're going to see how I respond to adversity. They're going to see how I respond to bad calls. They're going to watch how I, they're going to know how I, you know, communicate with them, how I, you know, all, all different types of things, but specifically I'm really aware of how I handle conflict. Anytime that our emotions can run, um, become unchecked. And, uh, in those situations, just always aware of, I've got, I've got these guys watching me. And if I'm going to come talk to them about faith or spiritual things or how, you know, God can, can change our lives, et cetera. Um, I better be living it out. So, um, I'm really aware of that as I coach. One thing I don't miss about coaching, you might have said this line to me once, but is it's a lot easier in an AD role not to lose control of my emotions. I felt like as a coach, once a week, I was going to apologize to one of my players. Like, right. You know, I just get mad, say something I shouldn't have in the moment, have to go back. Yep. I think you have a unique personality where you're by nature pretty calm. And if I criticize you, you underreact as opposed to overreact. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that's always been the case. How do you refine that emotional maturity outside of just experience? Yeah, well, I think I think why you coach really matters when it comes to this topic. I mean, how do you stay centered? How do you not let your emotions run unchecked? How do you not react to everything that doesn't go your way? You want to be successful. You Your players are counting on you to do a good job. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of the pressure we put on ourselves as coaches. And that's the reality of it. I think knowing why you coach centers you there. And I think learning to know I've been called to coach. I believe it from, you know, um, what we just talked about, but just learning to trust God in those times and realize it's not all up to me. And if he called me to do this, he's going to take care of me. Now that doesn't, that's not a license to be sloppy and to not work hard. That's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is I can trust him and I don't have to have everything go my way and I can trust him to to work out those details. And so there's some, there's some just comfort in knowing that. And there's, that's how I stay calm under pressure. And that's how I'm able to, to, uh, I think, stay calm in those situations. However, that doesn't mean I'm always that way. And you, I think you hit on something key when you said go back and apologize. That's part of the process too, is when you blow it and you will, um, you lose your, your cool, you emotionally lash out at a player you need to go make it right. And that is saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Will you forgive me? And I think that's an important piece to this as well. You're not going to be perfect. But just like in parenting, I see so many similarities. There's times we have to go back and apologize to our kids. And uh, same is true with our players. And it's it's counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of people, because it's, I think leaders almost, I mean, unless it's just something insane they did. Sure. Just a simple, hey, I screwed up here. My bad. Yeah, build so much credibility. Yep. Everybody worries it's going to make them feel weak, or they, you know, gosh, kind of makes me. Oh, you're human too. That's great, and you yeah. acknowledge it. <laughs> How do your players react the first when you apologize to them? Typically, yeah, I think they appreciate it. I think it almost builds more trust, and um, just to see that. And and just the other day, I was talking to him, and I was like, guys, when I ask you to do something, I'm not coming from a position of, I have it all figured out, and I did this perfectly when I played, and you need to get up to my level. I said, a lot of the things I asked you to do are things I didn't do well, and I want better for you. 
And I think just that's the reality of it. As coaches, we're trying to help the next group, the next generation improve, get better, handle things, um, handle pressure. A lot of the stuff, you know, trying to trying to stay calm under pressure and 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 not be reactionary. I didn't do that great as a player. I don't I don't want that that same outcome for my players. I want them to handle it much better. And and I think when we have a better perspective of why we do what we do, we enjoy it more. And I can't say that most of my playing career, I enjoyed it. I think it was stressful. I felt pressure, had a lot of success, but I was afraid to fail. And it's that's that's not always a great place to be at. So I talk to my own kids about that. I want them to have a better experience than, than I probably did. I think that's a, that's a good point. I was, we had a soccer game at friends the other night and it was one of those nights where I felt proud because our, our teams did a really good job. The other team was just angry and yelling at officials, yelling at each other. And I sat there annoyed, but also just like, there's no way they are having fun in Mm -hmm. anything. And it doesn't always have to be fun, but it's just kind of stupid to be angry all the time. And something you spend a lot of time on. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think the word that I use is joy. I think you got to really enjoy what you're doing. And part of that is going through the adversity, the good, the bad and having success. That's fun. That's a, it's a brings joy. But just the baseline you get when you come out here every day and you're working for two, three hours in the weight room, you, you have to have a genuine joy and, and it has to be a, a fun experience. Do you think kind of how you go about it, I, I do think is different. Do you think the approach, the winning has helped to get you more ability with guys or is it the same battle every year? Because I guarantee you're different than 95% of the coaches they've had before you. Yeah, I think I think as long as I have a, a, a large group of returners, it's easier because I think we have that success. They've seen it. They talk to the new guys about how we do things. Um, when I have a large group of, of new players, it can be a little bit of a struggle because I probably am different than their coaches. And I think that can always be a little bit of a challenge. But when you've had success with with guys and they've seen the fruit of it, I think that the, that they'll share with the new guys kind of how we do it and to trust it. And, and definitely is is uh, easier that way. But w- when I have a large group, it's a new learning experience. And, and Rob, I, I just don't think you can, I mean, we can go into a classroom and talk about, hey, we got to respond right. We got to, we got to handle adversity. We got to, you know, think differently. But how do you, how do you do it unless you get out there and you're competing in real experiences and and you got the emotions um going that's when you learn if you if you you have to make the right choice then so i think if you look at the history of of our program we're not always great early but i think as we learn to not become distracted by things that we can't control and make better choices and control our emotions and focus on just what it takes to win games and and constantly fight against all the things that pull you away from that and your focus away from that i think we get better as we go and um and i think then in those those games where it matters a lot we can stay calm we can enjoy them and and uh and compete and i i, I just want to I, I just want my players to be free to just give it all they got, put their whole hearts into it and win or lose. We're going to walk out of here with our, with our, um, you know, chins up because we did what we could do. And that's just be the best comp- competitors on the field. All right. Follow up question. You know, you've talked about the faith element being important and kind of your purpose behind your coaching. How much does winning matter within, within all that? Well, I think it does matter in the sense that you want your players to have the best possible experience they can have. And I think that is a piece to it. Um, I I think it would be foolish to put all of this time into it and not have that as one of the outcomes we'd like, but we, we don't focus on that. Um, Ultimately, is it that important? I don't, I don't, I probably not, but I think it is important that we, we try to work on a process. We focus every day. Um, I think it's that that pursuit of trying to be a team that can win, that can win big games, that can win championships, that it shapes your character. It forces you into failure and you have to respond well. 
Um, I think to take that out, I, I think we would have no mission, no purpose. Where are we going? Um, so I, I do think I do think it is um, something we need to think about. It's something we need to shoot for. And I think uh, um, accomplishing something together as a team and having that mission um, is is uh, is very important. And I think you know being excellent and what you want to what you're doing is important. And I think uh, you know as the faith as my faith and has impacted why I coach and why I do what I do. I, I mean, I want to be excellent in it. I want to, I want to have, create the best experience for our players and work extremely hard that they leave um, feeling good about uh, what we accomplished, whether it's on the field or off the field or spiritually or academically, we want to, we want to do the best we can. Well said. want to, want to shift gears quite a bit. Um, we were on the golf course together a couple weeks ago and talked about, and I think it goes back to me and you were young coaches together and made a lot of mistakes and how we closed the gap for young coaches. And that's one of the, I think one of the purposes of this, these conversations I'm having on this podcast, but what I want to get, how do we train coaches? So the question is, what do you think coaches sh- should learn early in the career, in their career, but they're not really taught? Yeah, I think, I think it's conflict resolution. Um, I think we need to do a very good job there. I think as a young coach, I mean, I'm thinking back when we coached together, probably picked too many battles and probably died on too many hills. Um, trying to find oh, yeah. I wanted to I wanted every one of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we, we, had, we were young. We, we had to, we had to, yeah, I, I think it's exactly, we, we, we have to learn how to handle conflict really well. I think finding out what's essential and what's not um, is really important. And then I just think handling that conflict, what I've learned from experience over time is that if it's done right, it will enhance your relationship with the player. Some of my best relationships with players right now are kids that I had the most difficult time with. And um, now some, I probably didn't handle the conflict very well. And I think I probably severed the relationship. And and those are the things you look back and, and you kind of regret, you do regret as a coach. But I think it's really important that we learn that discipline's important. You don't want to avoid things or be inconsistent. But when you do that discipline, you want to protect the relationship. And you do that, I believe, by communicating why we're doing what we're doing. And ultimately, um, I tell my players this, if I, if, I didn't, if I didn't care about you or didn't love you, I would do nothing. And you need to understand that we, we have discipline, we have um, rules, we have things that we put in place and it's in your best interest. It's for your good. And so I think you have to communicate, explain the why. And, you know, the relationship is always essential. You're protecting it. You're walking through it with them. You're communicating with them. I think uh, it's, I think I've become better at this since I've had kids and I'm a dad. I think that is the same process you go through with your kids. So I'm a, say, I'm a 26 year old, first time head coach. I have kids just I perceive them to be just totally working against me. What's your advice? How do you work with that? How do, how do you train them to help them not? Because I mean, I was going to go flip over the table and yeah, go out. Yeah, what kind of advice to so that coach look through yeah. those situations? Yeah, I think first, I, I think just this generation's more distrusting. So I think you have to build trust. They're not going to trust you just because you're the coach and you have the title. I think you got to understand that right away. Your job is to build trust. One, show competency in what you're doing, I think, and then show consistency. Be the same person day in, day out. Do not pretend that you have all the answers and you are, um, I think that's the worst thing. I think you have to be genuine. You have to work hard. Um but I think you're going to, sometimes it just takes time, but you can also communicate. You can have those one-to-one. Um, I, I, if, I, if I have an issue with a player, I'm not going, this drives me crazy, but um, sometimes you'll see this. If there's an issue with one, I, I can't remember where I learned this, but I think it has been very good for me. Um, if I have an issue with one player, I'm going to talk to that player. I'm not going to address the team 
about an issue with one player. Does that make sense? Sometimes you see coaches yeah. do that. And I think that's just, then everybody in the group's going, well, is it me? Is he talking about me? Was it, did I do something? I do a lot of one-on-one meetings and I'll just come in and explain to them what I see and listen and try to try to listen to what they have to say, why, why there's an issue. The other thing is I've started each year and I, and I got this from um, a book, but I start each year with meetings and, and my question is, how can I coach you? How, how can I coach you better and, and ask them? And so we start with those meetings and we'll do some meetings halfway through the year where we'll see how things are going and then we'll do our year end meetings. So I think the more I communicate with them, I can head off things and build trust. I don't know how you do it if, if it's not through communication and time. So if you're feeling like someone's resisting you as a young coach, it's probably that they don't trust you and you need to spend more time communicating and maybe just more time listening. What is it? How can I coach you better? And what can I do? Um, and also just putting it out there and just being open and honest with them in a non threatening way, not an emotional way, but just, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. Can you, can you, am I right? Am I wrong? And, and get, see what they have to say. Yeah. You make it sound simple and just common sense, but it's, it's certainly not easy. Yeah, it's not, it isn't easy. And it's very, very frustrating. And it's, that's the hard part of dealing with it. And I think that's where as a coach, you can, you can start to just avoid things. It's like, man, every day, it seems Mm -hmm. like I'm, and that, that is, that is the challenge. Can I be consistent? Can I not, uh, you know, and it doesn't, I think when you learn to do it well, and, and I still have those tendencies to be inconsistent, to want to avoid stuff. But I think when you do it well, it's not this big emotional experience where everybody's upset. It's just, Hey, so I see, can you give me some insight? Hey, here's what I need you to do. Are we on the same page? And, and I think also, you know, I tell my players, you can come to my office and tell me anything you need to tell me. You can tell me I'm the worst coach you ever played for. That is fine. But when we leave, we're on the same page. So I tell me, I want to hear it. I, I, you know, once you've done this long, if you don't feel threatened, you're not insecure about who you are as a coach, tell me if you, if you feel that way, then then say it. And then let's work to build trust, to get on the same page, to figure out um, how I can coach you well, because that's it. It's not one, it's not one coaching strategy for all it's, man, what's this player need? And I think that's, that's probably how I've shifted. I was trying to do a blanket for all as a young coach. Now it's more, what do I need to do to help him? And it's not about me. It's about him. So how can I help him? What, how can I connect with this player? All right, I'm going to counter. We have a older coach here at, at Friends who has had unbelievable success over his career, but he gets so frustrated with saying because we talk about what you just said quite a bit, and response is always, "Why am I always the one having?" Tapped? What's your response to that, Coach? You just cut out on the last part. Of it. Can you say it again? Okay. He says, why this coach would say, "Why am I the one having to adapt? I'm in charge, and they adapt to me on some level." What's your response to that coach who says that? Well, I think we're the leader and we have to be the one to, um, we have to be the first to, um, um, I think, step out and connect. I, I think I, I hear what he's saying and I think um, it's kind of like parenting. Why do I always have to do this, you know? But we are the the leaders and I think it's our responsibility to try to connect with players and make sure that, you um, they are having um, a good experience. I do think it is a two-way street, and I talk to my my players about that. It's it's both, so I don't think it's a one-sided. But I think we are the ones who should initiate if we see something that needs to change, or if we see something. I think we are the leaders, and we need to be the ones initiating. But it does it does wear you out. It's hard and. Sometimes you wish they would just do immediately what you say, but I don't think that's always reality. And I think um, from my experience, I could end up um, banging my head in a wall uh, against a wall, kind of a, a feeling if I just am waiting for them to change instead of yeah. maybe initiating that change and starting that process. And but I too, I don't I don't know that they always recognize it. So, you know, from experience coaching. I mean, hundreds of players, you see similarities and patterns and, oh, this player's responding like maybe this one did. And so mm-hmm. you, 
initiate to help. You're trying to get them in a good place. You're not trying to, um, you're, you want them to stay in this team in this circle and, and, and be a, be a very productive team member. So I think we are protecting that and that culture and you're trying to head off things before they get too bad and initiate change where you see it needs to be done. So I think that's our responsibility to be the first to act. So as, as you were kind of describing your approach to conflict and working with kids, it, people that listen to this probably get sick of hearing it. Um, I read a book two summers ago called Do Hard Things, mm-hmm. which kind of defines resiliency and toughness. And they cite a whole bunch of research that says toughness, like within a team, has two characteristics. One, it's it's a group with psychological safety, which doesn't mean safe space. You're never mad. You're never offended. Right. But as long as I follow the rules of the team and the group, I get to be part of it, even if I don't perform at times. Mm-hmm. And then number two is competency of feeling like you can get better w- within the group. And I mean... I think that pretty much summarizes how you try to, how you've described approaching building the community and also the competency of just being able to get better. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I think a hundred percent. I think we're just trying to build a space like we're, our culture. The thing we talk about is you are connected. I, I, I can't remember which book it was. Maybe it was, um, um, it was, I think it was Grant's biography. I can't remember who wrote it, but I loved it. It's so simple, but when Grant and Lincoln were meeting at one point, right before Lincoln left, he looked at Grant and he said, remember your success is my success. And I think about that all the time in the sense that we're trying to create a culture where if I get better, you get better too. We're all interconnected. And so we're about making each other better. We're working together. It's not who's the best and who's the worst. It's we're all in this together and we're all trying to get better. And we're all trying to put our gifts in the center and say, Hey, whatever I can do to help us win or, or to be successful and to improve every day. And so, yeah, I think that's it. And I think when we pursue those hard things, which are championships, which are, are, you know, playing really at a high level for four months or five months, those are rewarding when we're all in it together on mission focused and bringing our gifts and abilities for the good of the team and saying here, here they are. And uh, I think that's, that's what we're after and that other, other focus and not on myself, but on how can I help this group of guys? I think in today's day and age, post COVID social media driven world, um, I'm hearing you say on some level, we're teaching interdependency Mm -hmm. where we don't just go off and find the people that agree with us or be isolated by ourselves with technology, but how do we be interdependent on each other? Yeah. Yeah. And we cannot be, we just can't do it alone. And, 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 and that's not fun. And for me, I love, you know, when we were on the staff together and I love that working together. If I, if it was me doing this by myself, I'm probably done pretty quick because I just didn't, I really enjoy working with others. And if I see strengths or if somebody has this, this gifting, then go lead in this area, do it. You're the best guy to do it. Go. And so I just think that's the same way we do our teams who we just work and, and are all in it together. Mm -hmm. Well, last topic, I, you know, I let everybody talks about how this generation has changed. Um, I think back to, so I'm 40, um, when I was in high school, so early two thousands, there, there was, I believe I blindly trusted my coaches more than what kids get today. Um, But I also think that our kids today have the same inherent wants and needs that, that we had back then. But I'm curious how the kids you're working with now, as opposed to 15, 20 years ago, how do you think they're the same? How do you think they've changed? I know people, I think, I think sometimes that can be a cop out. I agree with it on, on certain levels where they have changed and generation are different, but I still think sometimes it can be a cop out of, well, kids these days, I I think it's our responsibility to go engage and figure out how to coach them best now. So I think differences one, I think, I think they're just as competitive. I hear kids aren't competitive these days. Yes, they are. If you explain to them why, and you get them to understand why this is important, they will give you everything they got. They will. I don't think they'll just do it because you're the coach. And so I think 
I think they, you really have to build trust. And once you build trust, I think they are just as competitive. They, I don't see a difference there. Um, they're just, we're all human beings and very similar. I mean, I think also, um, they will handle adversity. They will, they will make good choices. They will do everything you want them to do. Um, you just got to really explain why you're doing what you're doing. But, um, I feel like that's been the case for a lot of, a lot of the players I've coached. Um, but there are some differences, I'm sure. I, I don't live there too much thinking about it, but I do, I did notice, you know, thinking about this, this question, just the trust issue. I don't think they inherently just trust you because you're the coach. You really have to work. And I think to, to earn that. And so we do it by just starting the communication process early on, on day one, they get here. And then when they trust you, I think, uh, I think then they will give you everything they got. 10 years ago. And now, how do you think it felt to be coached by you? I think early on, you know, I think it felt really controlling and stifling and not very creative early on in my coaching career. I think everything was very black and white and we had to do things a certain way and we all had to be the same person. I don't think it was very much fun um, looking back. Um, now, I think it's much more freeing. I think you are you have the ability to be who you are and um, I think it's a lot more enjoyable. And I think it's more collaborative now than it was when I was a young coach. I had the answers. Here's how we're going to do it. Now it's, hey, what do you think we should do here? And mm -hmm. okay, I hear you. I think we should do this. And here's why I'm thinking this. And, and having a leadership team of six to eight guys and saying, guys, what do you think? Here's what I'm thinking. What are your thoughts? And just very collaborative we're in it together. I happen to be the coach and I have to make the ultimate decision, but I really want your input one and two, I value it. Let's work together and let's see what we can come up with. So I think it's, it's more enjoyable now, more, more collaborative than it was as an, as an early coach. Mm -hmm. Well said. All right. We're going to move a call, finish up each episode with the rapid fire round. So you have no longer than 30 seconds to answer any of these questions. So here we go. What's one thing we haven't covered that we should have? I think as a coach, you need to really, um, you need to take care of yourself. I think that is spiritually, um, physically, you have to have a good process and routine to take care of your own, own health to be the best you can possibly be. What is one book that has greatly influenced your life? I think the book that I've read most recently is Every Moment Matters. Um, I think it's a phenomenal book. It's laid out really well. And I think it can really uh, make a big difference in your coaching if you're looking for a resource. I'm staring at that book on my desk <laughs> based on your recommendation. I read it this summer. Um, how has failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Um, I think I've learned. I think it's part of my personality. I am a learn by doing. So I learn by failing and then learning from it. So embrace failure. It's part of the process. You're going to make mistakes. Just learn from it and don't. Um, so don't run from it. So I think that's that's how I would say you need to deal with failure. Gotcha. Last question. In the last five years, what new belief, behavior or habit has most improved your life? Oh, I think just in seeing the my entire coaching career and just even recently, um, I think just learning to really trust God with my work has freed me to just be the best I can be, to engage, to um, and, and just trust him with those results. And um, I think that's what I've really learned as I've seen him kind of guide me through the ups and downs of coaching and the good seasons and the bad seasons and learn it's not all up to me and I can trust him with it. Well said. Well, this has been a blast. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Well, it's always good to chat with you and thank you, Rob. And I just uh, have tons of respect for you and just really value your friendship. And who knew that you, you know, when you came to coach with me that we were, it was actually going to be the start of a really good friendship. So I really appreciate yeah. you. And it was a pretty much a blind date on the interview. <laughs> so <laughs> if uh, people want to ask you follow up questions, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Well, um, I'm going to date myself because it's not going to be social media, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you can shoot me an email or 
uh, they could even text me if they wanted to, but I'm not going gotcha. to give you, they can get my number from you. Yeah. Well, I'll put it in the show notes and I, you know, we worked together before cell phones for the most part. I still have your number, cell phone number memorized. You and my wife, <laughs> I think is what I got. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Beyond Coaching is a podcast of the Impactful Coaching Project in partnership with Friends University. The Impactful Coaching Project seeks to develop coaches that coach the whole person. The Impactful Coaching Project is the thought leader in coaching the 21st century athlete and produces training, information, and original research to help coaches develop. For more information, check out impactfulcoachingproject.substack.com. Thank you for listening.